We're going to take, I'm going to take her to six. Okay. Or there's a spot on the six. Okay, but that's fine. Morning? Morning. That is not a jury that I would like. <laughs>
OV6 should be and then you think PRV7 should be 10. Yep. Okay, I didn't have 6.
We almost ready? Yeah, almost. Okay. Okay. The next day is the <laughs> September. Yeah, September. Yeah, it's the next day. Those are fun. Cool. September 12th is. No, I'm, um, no, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, September 19th is the final. I saw it. Thank you. Perfect. It's just, uh, it's just not here. Let me see if it's here. Yeah, it's here. I know.
How you scored it? I just want to double check. I got you right there. Um, or should I wait for it? No, I got you right here. I got OB for you as 25. Yeah. And I think that's guys doesn't matter because we're both in class too. Right, that's right. So PRB, you don't get 10? Just 10. Just and I have zero. Alright. And what are your guys, what are the range now for you? That's 180. Yeah. PRB. 300.
It's actually not. We don't have that much to do. There's only a couple of these. Yeah, there's only a few that we Although, I mean, there's one that the pre-sense report scores wrong. I know. That it, the World Wolf. Well, 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 there's two they score wrong. I mean, three is 50, but it should be 25. Yes. Everyone's. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honor. May it please the Court, Athena Sarigas, on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Patrick Muscat, on behalf of the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office. Okay, go ahead, Ms. Carpenter. Good morning, Your Honor. Cheryl Carpenter, on behalf of Mr. Wafer, who's standing to my left. And Matt Carpenter, Mr. Wafer. All right. Your Honor, would it be okay, may I have the Court's permission to go sit at the table with Mr. Wafer for the sentencing? I have a lot of papers that I have over there that I need. Does yeah, we're going to have him stand there for elocution, though. Okay, that's fine. Just yes. take a seat right here. Thank yes. you. Okay, first things first. Ms. Carpenter, have you had an opportunity to go over the pre-sentence report with your client? Yes, Your Honor. Any additions, corrections, or deletions? Uh, just minor ones, Your Honor. Go ahead. Um, on page one on the evaluation and plan at the very last paragraph. Yes. Um, the fourth sentence is, he has been sentenced to jail on one previous occasion. That's um, incorrect. He's never been sentenced to jail before. Okay. Any objection to me deleting that from the people? You know, I, I didn't see... I don't have any information relating to that. I don't know where... I, I really can't address it. Okay. Well, at that... Uh, I'll delete that. It's not going to have any impact on my sentencing. Give me one second. It is the fourth sentence. He's been sentenced to jail. Yes. I think they got that because it said two days confinement. Okay. 
Your Honor. Um, Anything else? Actually, they, they do have here on the same page on one, two, three, fourth paragraph, substance abuse, including the drugs, marijuana, and alcohol. And I just want to make clear, and it does show further on in the um, evaluation, that the marijuana was occasional in the 1970s. It's been over 20, 30 years since Mr. Wafer has used it. And the same with alcohol. He does not have any substance abuse problems. Okay. All right, any other corrections? No, Your Honor. Okay. Now let's go through the variables. Let's start with the people. Are the variables scored accurately? Uh, they are not, Your Honor. Go ahead. Uh, Your Honor, the people believe that OD3 should be scored 25 points as opposed to 50. Okay. What is the defense position? Uh, we believe it should be zero, Your Honor. Your Honor, the people cited to People versus Houston, which is a 2005 Supreme Court case that indicates specifically the facts are right on point that OD3 when it is a homicide, because there's an instruction that you shouldn't get 100 points for a homicide, but specifically the Supreme Court has held that you do, in fact, get the 25 points for a homicide, which is all the people are asking for, consistent with People v. Houston at 473 Mitch, 399. I've read it, Ms. Syringas. I read it before you even submitted your uh, sentencing memo, and it's, it's the only issue raised in People v. Houston, and it's uh, directly on point, so... I think 25 points has to be assessed for OV3. Um, Your Honor, may Go I ahead. put my objection on the record on this one? Um, it says that um, scoring 25 points, or no, the 50 points, if the death results from operation of a vehicle, vessel, ORV, a snowmobile, aircraft, locomotive, or any of the following apply, um, none of that applies, Your Honor. Yeah, the, and that's one of the reasons that I researched it before we had the sentencing was uh, my concern, and it's 25 points, so what applies is life-threatening or permanent incapacitating injury occurred to a victim. I believe in People v. Houston, that victim was actually shot, and the entire issue was whether 25 points should have been assessed um, when there's a death, and they said, yeah, it it's a life-threatening injury before it becomes a death. It, there is case law on this, and it's a Supreme Court case, so I really have no discretion here when it was that clear-cut. You don't believe that is a just ruling or would be fair to assess points, and I do, and if, if you're on I have, have to research, follow the law, whether I agree with it or not. That's, that's not really my, uh, that's not, my, my job is to follow the law. Whether I agree with it or not, that's, that's, what my task is. I know, and, and Your Honor, I do think the law, the statute, not case law, but if you look at the plain language of this statute, of this offense variable three, physical injury to a victim, we have a homicide, we have a death. Why are, if this wasn't the negligence that was caused by the automobile, um, boat, that kind of things, where they took this, this is what the purpose was for this offense variable, if we have, we're going to have Mr. Wade for sen sentence to a murder too. There's a death. He caused the death. Then why are we giving him extra points that he caused life-threatening or permanent incapacitating injury? And that is more life-threatening. And if you read the 25.1, Your Honor, that seems like more applicable to cases where the victim survived and now maybe... One would think. I, I, I know. <laughs> One would think. I'm just telling you what the law is. It's directly on point. I have to follow it. That's something that you uh, you are welcome to take up with the appellate courts to have them change their previous opinion, but the Supreme Court has stated 25 points has to be assessed. It couldn't be more clear. But I, I, I agree with what you're saying, Ms. Carpenter, but I cannot disregard the state of the law. Okay, moving on. Any other uh, offense variables? That, oh, so the people have no issue with the way the PRBs are scored? No, Your Honor. Okay. Any other offense variable? The offense me. variable six, Your Honor, should be scored 25 points. Uh, there's a specific <clears throat> instruction that the court should assess those points consistent with the jury verdict, and the jury verdict is 25 points, second-degree murder. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Carpenter. Your Honor, this is another one where I'm going to ask the court to look at the plain reading of this statute, because even in the... Um, 
our Michigan Sentencing Guidelines Manual, they don't even put down the whole statute in this book. If you look at the statute, and the statute for OV6 is MCL 777.36, subsection 2. And I, you know, I'll tell you, the defense believes OV6 should be zero. I mean, actually, it should be 10 points, not 25, Your Honor. And um, I think you need to look at the subsections in this statute because A says, the sentencing judge shall score this variable consistent with the jury verdict unless the judge has information that was not presented to the jury. You have that in this case, Your Honor. There was a lot of evidence the jury didn't get that were excluded um, motions in limine or during trial. For example, um, Ms. McBride's cell phone pictures, her drug use, her uh, drug dealing, her aggressive behavior when she was young. You have the crime map to show what kind of neighborhood Mr. Wafer lives in. The jury didn't get all of that. That's why the statute says, if you, Your Honor, has more information than the jury got, you must take that into consideration when scoring this variable. And I think subsection A, when you know all that information that was presented to you, it just wasn't admitted, that now requires 10 points instead of 25. Also, you can do and or B. I think both apply, but you can find either one to score 10. So B says score 10 points if the killing is intentional within definition of second-degree murder, voluntary manslaughter, which we all agree Mr. Wafer didn't have intent, uh, that he didn't get convicted of anything in quite requiring intent. Um, but the death occurred in a combative situation or in response to victimization of the offender by the decedent. That's what happened in this case, Your Honor. Yeah, but that's if, it, if the killing was intentional. Okay, I, you may have a point with respect to the first argument. Ms. Well, Arindis, I, I do you want to respond to that? Your Honor, the, the argument, the first argument, this goes to the intent of the defendant. It has nothing to do with a victim, and here we are again talking about the victim for conduct that is irrelevant to anything that we're here for. The defendant on the stand indicated he intentionally shot Ms. McBride. How could she now sit here and argue that it wasn't intentional? That was his testimony on the stand that he did it on purpose, intentionally shot. If you look at PRV, if you look at the 25 points, it specifically states the intent of murder in the second degree. It's yeah. the elements for murder in the second degree. That's what the jury convicted him of. The jury did not convict him of manslaughter. Well, they did, but in addition to the murder too. He's been convicted of a murder too. She wants a scoring consistent with manslaughter. That's not what this jury found. And the instructions specifically say that the court is bound by the jury's decision. Those factors that she's talking about have nothing to do with his intent. If the court found that they did, somehow the court, I assume, would have allowed it. And so there was no evidence that would have allowed that to be admitted. There's nothing here before this court that would allow you to score 10 points as opposed to 25. The law requires that you score 25 points. It's a murder in the second degree. Okay. And, Your Honor, if you just look at the, at the plain language of 25 and 10, 10 fits more um, what happened in this case. The offender had intent to injure. The killing was committed in an extreme emotional state. Your Honor heard Mr. Wafer testify. I think it's clear, and he was honest. He has never been so afraid in his life. He was in an extreme emotional state. Um, and before a reasonable amount of time elapsed for the offender to calm, um, or there was gross negligence amounting to an unreasonable disregard for life. Mr. Wafer, in those two to three minutes, Ms. McBride was at his house, it just escalated and escalated. He had no opportunity to calm down. It was in the heat of the moment. This was a killing that wasn't premeditated. It wasn't intended in the fact that I want to kill somebody. He didn't go to bed that night hoping that he'd wake up and kill somebody that morning. It was done with extreme emotional um, state of mind. And it is Mr. Wafer's uh, state of mind you must look at. And you do have all of that other information. And that subsection A in the statute allows you to take that into consideration. I'd ask that you score 10 points. Okay. And uh, thinking about all the things that were excluded from the trial, the main reason was because I, I thought they had no bearing on this trial and that they were irrelevant. And for that reason, I think that 
the points need to be scored consistent with the jury verdict. So OV3 we're reducing to 25, OV6 we're increasing from 10 to 25. Any other offense variables that need to be corrected? Your Honor, OV17 is scored five points that people believe it should be scored zero. No okay. Objection, Your Honor. All right. And that takes us to what? Uh, 95. I have a total of 95 points, Your Honor, on the OV, which is an offense level two. 95. And just for the record, Your Honor, I think um, OV1 is 25. Thank you. Yeah. And OV2 is five. And then defense objection, OV3 is 25. OV5 is 15. Do you have any objection with that? No, Your Honor. Okay. All right, so we've covered the offense variables, which take us to guidelines of 180 to 300. Is that accurate? Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, but I do have an objection to a PRV. Oh, go ahead. Um, so just to By make all sure, means. the offense variable is scored at 95 points? Yeah. That's yeah. good, too. And, Your Honor, to, to be honest with you, my if you had ruled in my favor, it would have been 55 points, and we still would have been in OV level 2. So we're both in the same level. Okay. Just to let you know that. Thank you. But the PRV is a, a very important. That does change the guideline scoring um, a lot, Your Honor. So uh, we, the prosecutor and the defense agrees that PRV 1 to 6 should be 0. Okay. Um, they believe PRV 7 should be um, 10. We believe it should be 0. Um, PRV uh, 7 is? Subsequent or concurrent felony convictions. Correct. And this is the issue on this case. When we had, we have an inconsistent jury verdict. Um, we have a conviction for murder in the second degree, and we also have a conviction for manslaughter. Um, and there was a, it is one conviction. I don't know how they're getting a concurrent conviction with that. Um, I will let the prosecutors um, put on the record what I was I was told today. But remember, Your Honor, and I do want to place this on the record that um, in the middle of the trial we had a bench conference. And we brought up, and Danielle Hageman Clark was still here, and we brought up. And the people the, said one need to be thrown out. Right. I remember. And they said if they oh, convict on both. No, okay. that's. It's okay. Go ahead. If, they, if a jury convicts on both, we will throw the lesser out. And actually, Samantha Burris and I. Well, I think it was said that I would have to right. throw, throw one of them out. Right. Go ahead. Because you can't have, there's one death. We're, we're, Mr. Wafer is not going to be sentenced to murder two and manslaughter. He has to be. They're different elements. But your honor, that's remember, the problem. Even though they said something at sidebar, that's not the state of the law. Your honor, go ahead. The defense relied upon what they said at sidebar, and the, your honor also agrees that they said it. I know they disagree that they said it. They also told me that two weeks prior, prior to trial, Daniel Hageman Clark told me up in her office the same exact thing. Now. They're trying to come in and say, no, no, now Mr. Waver's going to be convicted of three felony counts. He's going to go to prison for murder, manslaughter, and then the felony firearm, which just follows whatever. It, it's inconsistent. It is improper. And we relied on information they are now going back on and saying they never said that. I should have put it in writing. And I don't think we got it off on the record. No, I don't think it was on the record either. But I think the, the assumption was that one, it, it didn't matter if one was going to be thrown out Anyway, because the other one would be uh, subsumed, if that's a an accurate term, by the um, the greater conviction. Right. So, it, 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 which happens all the time. I mean, we there's multiple chargings that happen all the time where I do have to sentence on each conviction as long as they're different elements. And in this case, there are different elements between murder two and uh, statutory manslaughter. But go ahead, let's hear from the right. people. Oh, go. Honor, ahead. If I can still oh yeah, go right ahead. Things. So um, also with PRV, if you look also at the plain language of PRV, um, let's see, the prosecutor mentions in footnote one of their memo that malice isn't required for a violation of this, but the statute actually says that what Mr. Wafer was convicted of was an offense without malice. Nobody, no jury found malice in this case. Um, and this means a conviction of second degree murder on this requires malice and statutory manslaughter without malice 
are legally inconsistent. So you shouldn't use that to score this. This should be zero, Your Honor. PRB 7 should be zero for the plain language of it and for what the prosecutors and the defense, what the prosecutors told defense prior to trial and mid-trial, and now they're going back and now trying to get 10 points on this when it should be zero. Where, where are, um, do you have the elements of statutory manslaughter handy? I believe that when it says without malice, that's just something that needn't be proved. Right. It's right. not. The, the key to this analysis, first of all, Judge, I have to clarify the record. Go ahead. There were several prosecutors at several sidebars during the trial. There certainly were. During one sidebar, we were discussing the verdict form, and there was a, a suggestion that the jury couldn't find the defendant guilty of murder two and count two, or the lesser of gross negligence on count one and count two. And it was represented that the jury could, and they said, if you want, we'll look into the possibility of a merger at sentencing akin to a murder one felony murder situation. But that's all we said, that we would look into the matter. And it wasn't something that had to be decided before the jury got the case and before the verdict form was completed. And that's where it was left. Since then, we talked to Mr. Boffman, and of course we looked into the matter. Count two has an element that count one does not require. Count two has so an element of the use of a firearm. That makes it a separate count. This is completely analogous to a situation where a defendant is convicted of murder in the second degree for use of a vehicle under the third prong of murder in the second degree, and is also convicted of driving away, uh, leaving the scene of an accident, causing death. It's the exact same scenario. You've had cases like that before. Defendant kills somebody, his level of, of, of the, his state of mind reaches the third prong of murder too because of, say, DUI, narcotics, his driving. And then as he kills somebody, he leaves the scene, and so he's charged with that 15-year felony on count two. This is the same situation. Mr. Wafer is convicted under, the, uh, under murder two because the jury either believed he intended to kill or he intended to commit great bodily harm, or the third prong. And he also is convicted of the intentional aiming because they used the firearm in a manner consistent with those elements. They're separate counts. No one promised defense counsel that these would merge. The only thing we said is that we would research the topic, and as the court has succinctly stated already, our goal is to follow the law. And the law is clear that these are separate convictions. The only relevance to the fact that there's a count two in this case is how it affects the PRB scoring because the sentence on count two is going to be is going to be um, consumed by the sentence on count one. Yeah, and that's that's what I was saying. Mm -hmm. I think that that was uh, the wrong word wording was used at sidebar, but I think that that it, the same result is ultimately reached. Because my concern was whether or not they could be convicted on both, and if they were, I think it was represented. I would just have to toss one, but. No, it was rep what was represented, and I'm not sure who said what, but what I recall was that we would research on whether or not there needs to be a merger akin to uh, the murder one felony murder situation that we run into all the time. And the law is clear. Because there is a separate element contained in count two, we don't have to have that merger. And we did. We talked to Mr. Boffman. We researched that. And um, we're confident you will give him a sentence on count two, and that will run concurrent to the sentence on count one. Yeah, I think that. And for the record, Go ahead. Your Honor, the, the prosecutor did state at sidebar, "We will nolly cross. We will dismiss." I didn't hear that. Court. I heard that I would have to toss one if uh, if they couldn't be convicted of both. I don't remember ever hearing anything that they would look into a felony murder or a murder one. But regardless, it truly makes no difference, given because attorneys say things that aren't the state of the law all the time, and whether or not. Uh, their representations are correct or not, I'm still bound to follow the law. And in this case, they are different charges. They are different elements. I don't, and I was just reviewing firearm intentionally aimed. I don't see anything that, I think the fact that it says without malice is just something that needn't be proved. It doesn't mean that without malice should have been proved. Proven, so I don't think that that makes them an inconsistent verdict. For that reason, I think ten points is accurate. But that that doesn't change where we're at right now. 
we're still at 180 to 300. But your objections noted, and that will be interesting to take up. Your, and your honor, Ms. Carpenter. <laughs> Thank you. And this trial has been interesting. <laughs> it continues. Um, your honor, it does change a lot. I, and I just want to put on the record the guidelines, if you would have scored that as zero for murder two, would have been 144 to 240 months. And um, now, your honor, I believe you said 180 to. Yeah, so it would have been, rather than being. What we're looking at 15 to 25, it would have reduced it from to 12 to 20. All right, it's noted. Okay, anything from the people? Any victim impact uh, statements to be made? Yes, Go ahead. We're limiting it to two. Who are we going to call? Uh, the victim's sister, Your Honor. Okay. Jasmine McBride, first name J-S-M-I-N-E. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. Renisha was a beautiful young lady with her whole life ahead of her. She was a goofy person with a smile that would light up any room. Renisha was smart, kind, and loving, and a family-oriented person. For me, she was more than just a sister. She was my best friend. We had our ups and downs, as many sisters would. More good times than bad. Renisha was the youngest sister, but she often played the role as the big sister. When I needed someone to talk to, she was always there to listen. When I cried, she was always there to comfort me. When I ran across hard times, she was always there to lift my spirits. Losing my sister was one of the most devastating times in my life. Many days I sit and think about the good times we shared and how they were cut short by, by a person's cowardly actions. Throughout the trial, Mr. Wafer stated how this tragedy has affected his life and how he often cried. Mr. Wafer also stated that killing my sister was an accident. I was taught to apologize when I made a mistake or an accident. Never once have I heard Mr. Wafer send his condolences or apologize to my family for taking our loved ones. I find it very hard to believe that his actions was an accident. I ask you today, Judge Hathaway, when sentencing Mr. Wafer, that you give him the maximum. I believe he needs time to think about his actions, like why he didn't call 911 instead of opening his door and killing my sister. Mr. Wafer, your actions impact a lot of other people besides just yourself. I thank God the judicial system worked and showed you as the killer you truly are. Somewhere down the line in life, I have to forgive you in order to be accepted into heaven myself. But I will never forget the pain, the hurt, the heartache, or the devastation you caused my family. Thank you. This is Fried. Not for TV. Okay, is there someone else? There's one more, yeah. Okay, step up, sir. What is your name, sir? I'm Walter Simmons, um, Renisha's father. Okay, go ahead. Um, uh, to the court, um, this man has ruined our family life. It's, um, it's not a day that go by that I don't think about my daughter. <coughs> I never had the opportunity to see her grow up, be a woman, have kids. Judge, I just hope you really give him the maximum sentence that's possible. I'm going to um, read a statement from my youngest daughter. My youngest daughter in the past week have had two panic attacks. That's why she couldn't come here. She was going to come to to make this statement herself. She wanted to. Okay, you can go ahead and read her statement. 
I, I am, <clears throat> but it's affected her so much to the point where she can't get this out of her mind because they grew up together when they were young and they were the best of friends and she really looked up to her to her sister her statement daughter is Lindsay Simmons um, you messed up a lot a lot of things you broke my heart because now I have no sister to talk to or be with anymore. We were quite close. So yeah, you ruined that. My sister was innocent and did not deserve what you have done to her. Having an older sister is very important for a girl growing up. And you threw that all away without even thinking about how it would affect others or even her directly. I hope while you're sitting all alone in that cold, dark jail cell that you will reevaluate yourself and realize that the bad that you're, you've done and how horrible you affected people in our family. So. Thank you, sir. All right. Any sentence recommendations from the people? Just, just very briefly. Go ahead. The only thing I want to focus the court on is what's stated in in the defense's um, memo filed okay. here, and basically, um, they try to argue for a manslaughter sentence. This defendant has been convicted of murder in the second degree. The guidelines are established by law, and they're 15 to 25 years. So the court does have wide latitude within those guidelines. The co court can go to the bottom. The court can go to the top of those guidelines in assessing what's appropriate for Mr. Wafer based on his past. But his conduct here, as this jury has found, is that of murder in the second degree. It's not that of manslaughter. They also found the manslaughter, but they also found the higher offense. It's really murder in the second degree that the court must be focused on and tailor that sentence to this defendant, which allows the court to go to the bottom of the guidelines being 15, go to the top being 25. But what's interesting is that this defendant has not accepted responsibility for his conduct. This defendant has continuously tried to point in the other direction. This defendant has continuously attacked the victim. This defendant has said, this is not my fault because she was drunk and she came to my door. We all f face choices and we all make decisions. On this day, this defendant chose to go get his shotgun. This defendant chose to confront the victim. This defendant made choices that resulted in the death of Renisha McBride. And you've heard from the family and the impact that it's had on Renisha McBride. And it's that conduct. We're not saying he's bad, he's good. It's the conduct that this court is here to sentence on. The conduct is that of murder in the second degree. And that's what this jury has said. So when defense tries to ask for a manslaughter sentence, it is totally inappropriate based on the facts in this case, based on his conduct, based on his testimony. Throughout these proceedings, and even from the beginning, defense tries to say that he's cooperated with the police. From the beginning, he's tried to shift what he did to it's an accident, to it's self-defense, but never taking any responsibility for his own actions, never taking any responsibility for his own conduct. I don't think the court can reward him for telling the, the uh, police one story and then getting up there under oath and testifying to something totally different. Under any other circumstances, we wouldn't call this honest. We would call him telling lies to try to get a certain result. So when the defense tries to say that he's been honest, he's been cooperative, the, the court heard the testimony. And his testimony has continuously been about trying to protect himself and not accepting any responsibility. Up to this point, We've not heard him accept responsibility, even in talking to the police. He said, who does that? 
Who knocks on somebody's door in the middle of the night? His always, his focus had not been on what he did and what his actions were, but on what she did. The jury has spoken, and they have said that his actions amount to murder in the second degree. Murder, not manslaughter. And we ask the court to sentence him accordingly. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Carpenter. You can argue your position before I give your client an opportunity to speak. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the jury has spoken. I still can't accept their verdict, but I will, for purposes of sentencing, I will not argue that this should have been manslaughter or should have been an acquittal because of self-defense. That's not the proper place. But the prosecutor is right, and I wrote it in a sentencing memo. I am asking this court to sentence within the manslaughter guidelines. Those would be, as how the court has scored it, um, I have it down as 43 to 86 months plus the two years. And I know, Your Honor, there's a big gap between my position and the prosecutor's position. They're asking for 15 plus two. That's 17 years in prison, Your Honor. That's a death sentence. Mr. Wafer is 55 years old. If you give him 17 years, he will never get out. Um, you had an opportunity to talk to these jurors, and we didn't get that. And they don't think he's a bad guy. They don't want a life sentence. They told you that. If you give him 17 years, it's a, it's a life sentence, Your Honor. So, so what I am asking, Your Honor, is to depart. I gave you numerous reasons um, in my sentencing memo why to depart in this case. And I want to step back before I, before I do it. I do want to address the McBride family, and Mr. Wafer will speak. Um, I don't know if I can, I never know if I can look at. <laughs> Just face the court. If, well, then, because I never know what's me. proper, yeah. and that's, and I want to explain it, even me as a lawyer who's done this for 15 years, when you're in a courtroom and you have a victim's family who's in pain, it's not easy to go up and shake their hand and say, I'm so sorry. So when they said they haven't heard an apology, it's because of me. Mr. Wafer will state, make his statement, but I will tell you, and I hope the McBride family will understand from the day one I met Mr. Wafer, he didn't think about himself. He wasn't my typical client would be going, what about me, what about me? His first question to me after he learned there was an autopsy was, does that mean her parents don't get to bury her? Does that sound like somebody who's not remorseful, who doesn't care? He has nightmares about Miss McBride, and he took a 19-year-old woman's life, gone. He lives with that every day. It's, it's, so when I hear that he hasn't taken responsibility, he has. And his remorse is more than any client I've ever seen. Um, and I do get emotional about this case and about Mr. Wafer. And I'm sorry, and I know my dad has told me don't cry in court. Um, <laughs> You're not um, a robot. Go ahead. I'm, I'm not, and I really care about this man. I do, Dad. And I feel like I let him down. And I'm hoping you don't, Your Honor. Let him get out of prison. And I will give you the legal reasons why you can. Um, and I will compose myself. <laughs> and that's what I said in my opening statement. I tell a story different than Mr. Wafer. We're completely different people. I'm so emotional. And he's not. But that doesn't mean he doesn't feel. And he does. Um, Substantial and compelling reasons, Your Honor. Um, and I wanted to step back and say for sentencing, there's two goals. There's um, <coughs> punishment, which I believe there should be. A 19-year-old girl is dead. The McBride family wants some justice, and they should get some incarceration. I agree. But then you have to balance that with rehabilitation as a trial court. So you've got the balancing act of how much do I punish a man and how much can he be rehabilitated. In this case, Your Honor, I've, I was telling the prosecutors, I don't, on murder two convictions, the sentencing guidelines are so low. Usually I'm scoring hundreds of points on things, not for Mr. Wafer. He is, um, rehabilitation for Mr. Wafer is, is high. You have 
Dr. Gerald Shiner's report. He did a psychological evaluation of Mr. Wafer. I read it. And um, it, it, he says in it that he is um, no history of violence, no loss of control, irritability, no antisocial trends. He's a mild-mannered, withdrawn man who structured his time with compulsive work habits. He represents no risk to the community. There's no paranoia in him. He has no prior episodes. He has a good, this is Dr. Shiner, who is very respected psychiatrist in these for cycle evaluations with the court. He says he has a good rehabilitation potential for understanding the destructive nature of his actions to himself in the community. And that he says, Dr. Shiner, in his professional opinion, says, Mr. Wafer represents very little risk to the community and that there would be no benefit to Mr. Wafer or the community in a lengthy confinement. Um, Mr. Wafer's never, ever going to own a gun again in his life. It will be unlawful, and he never wants to touch a gun again. And his only way to reoffend is if he owned a shotgun. <clears throat> If he didn't own a shotgun and he wishes he didn't have one that night and this never would have happened, he, he was always good on bond. Uh, he always showed up. He is not, he, he needs to get some therapy. So, Your Honor, um, so when you balance those two, and I think you need to look at the substantial and compelling reasons to show that there is much rehabilitative potential and that Mr. Wafer deserves a chance to get out of prison at one day. And I know you've read my sentencing memo and, um, I've listed, I've given you, you know, you know Your Honor, <laughs> you're, you're an intelligent judge. You know that you only need one substantial and compelling reason to depart downward. And I gave you about 11 of them. And just like a reasonable doubt, you just need to pick one. And they have to be verifiable. You can't just make them up. And they can't be recognized already in the sentencing guidelines. And I've given you things that are articulable, that aren't in the guidelines and that apply in this case. His prior record is number one. He's got two drunk drivings from 1998 and 1994. Nothing since then. That shows you, Your Honor, he can be rehabilitated. He did have a little bit of a pattern there, drinking and driving, and then when the second time came around and he got treatment, he walks to the corner pub if he goes a couple times a month. It shows. He, he learns his lesson, lesson. His age, Your Honor, is the second reason. He's 55. He's not an 18-year-old kid that you could give a 20-year sentence to and will get out. Um, work history, he is, uh, as Dr. Shiner said, he kind of did get compulsive with work. That's where he put all of his energy into. And just days before the shooting, Mr. Wafer um, asked for a, a change in his position at the airport. He went from outside building maintenance to inside work. He, it was a demotion. He wanted it. He got a little bit less money. But his health was getting to be a point where he couldn't take the outside work. He was going to learn computers for the first time in his life. And this was just days. And that, I think that also goes to show you what kind of man pulled that trigger that night. An aging man who likes his neighborhood and was scared. Um, the fourth reason, circumstances around the arrest, including cooperation with the police. I, I don't know why the prosecutor is saying he is not cooperative. Um, and I, I tried to explain, and Mr. Wafer didn't lie. He did say accident, but it was one of those semantics. When you say a word and you don't know how it happened in the heat of it, you're like, it was an accident. It wasn't, and, and he took responsibility. He didn't say somebody else did it. He never said Renisha grabbed for my gun or it dropped on the floor. That would have been avoiding responsibility. Um, number five, Your Honor, I went over that in length, how you can rehabilitate Mr. Wafer. Um, I, I, there's no escalation of the crime by law enforcement. I'm still just, though, if there was more evidence collected and a better investigation done, we would have had more proof she was breaking and entering. He didn't do any community service. Community support, Your Honor. I do want to talk about this for a minute. I gave uh, the court about, I think, 15 letters of support. I read them. And what was amazing, and I, I hope you read the one from um, Larry Bagger. Larry Bagger is a CEO of a company in Chicago. He mm -hmm. called me out of the blue months ago. He went to college with Mr. Wafer. They played at Northern Michigan University on the football team together. And they hadn't stayed in contact, but Mr. Bagger called me up and was shocked. It was 
Ted who got into the situation. He said of all the men on the football team, Ted was a starting uh, defensive on the defensive line as a freshman. Steve Mariucci was quarterback. I always think that's great uh, as a senior quarterback. And uh, Ted dropped out after a year of college. He couldn't quite, you know, he didn't, he didn't think he had the intelligence for it. Um, and he, even though he's a college football player, he was the most mild-mannered, get-along-with-everybody type of guy, and that's who he is today. He is not outgoing. He, he's never had, and you saw, I gave you some, the free press talks to some neighbors that I couldn't get talk to talk, and they all said, did you read that one free press article where the neighbor said, I talked to Ted after the shooting, he was so scared. And they all think he's a good neighbor, nobody wants to get involved. That's why you're not seeing all their letters, but I have talked to many of them. Nobody has any issues with Ted in the neighborhood. He's that type of neighbor you want. He keeps the corner house clean. He helps cut the lawns for the elderly people. He gives out the best Halloween candy, according to one of his teenage neighbors. Um, Your Honor, and the ninth reason for a substantial and compelling reason to depart is his family support. Mr. Wafer's family is everything to him. It's his world. That's, that's why he doesn't have a wife. He kind of never found the right woman, and then he just kind of gave up on ever having his own family. So he, um, he has an elderly mom with dementia who will die soon. His father, who was his best friend, died about two years ago. And I just ask, when you think about family support, he's got a brother and a sister also, that he can get out at some point to see his mother before she dies. Um, there's no drug or problems. Mitigating circumstances, Your Honor. You heard that in trial. You know why. And this wasn't planned. He didn't go out looking for this. It came to him, Your Honor. And maybe he did make a bad choice in opening that door. Um, but the choice doesn't define who he is as a person. Uh, less, less serious nature of the offense is another uh, substantial and compelling reason to depart. Your Honor, I, I really do believe if there was a conviction, it should have been manslaughter. It really does fit a manslaughter more than a murder. The jury didn't see it. Um, demonstration of good behavior while on bond. Uh, he, he's been, have had no issues, uh, no flight risk. He's always he's beat me to court a lot of times. And then the last one, and this is where I'll end, Your Honor, and let Mr. Wafer say something, because I've spoken for a lot. Thank you, Your Honor, for letting me, for listening. Um, remorse for Ms. McBride. That's not taken into account in the sentencing guidelines. And you heard the family wants to hear it. Anybody would. Um, and he has it. And I told Ted to share. It's hard for him. He's, uh, he knows all the eyes are on him, but... I think it's better for him to tell you and the family his remorse than if I do. So, okay. I would ask, though, Your Honor, that before Mr. Wafer speaks, that you do sentence within the manslaughter guidelines. Go on the top of the guidelines uh, for manslaughter, the 80, 80 months plus two, or go somewhere in between. If you don't think, if you think manslaughter is too low, go somewhere in between the two. But if you give him, if you give Mr. Wafer anything more than eight years plus two, he's never coming out of prison alive. Okay. Do you want to come up with your client, Mr. Wafer? This yeah. is the time and date set for sentencing. I understand there's something you'd like to say on your own behalf. Parents, family, and friends of Renisha McBride, I apologize from the bottom of my heart. And I am truly sorry for your loss. I can only hope and pray. That somehow you can forgive me. My family and friends also grieve. For from my fear, I caused the loss of a life. 
I was too young to leave this world. And for that, I'll carry that guilt and sorrow forever. I only wish that I could take this horrible tragedy back. I ask the court and your honor for mercy. Thank you, Mr. Wafer. This is one of the saddest cases I have ever had. Um, a young woman's life is gone, and an otherwise a law-abiding citizen's life is ruined. Uh, a common theme from the letters from your friends and family, Mr. Wafer, is that of bad choices. And although the evidence clearly showed in this case that Miss McBride made some terrible choices that night, None of them justified taking her life. I do not believe that you are a cold-blooded murderer or that this case had uh, anything to do with race or that you are some sort of monster. I do believe that you acted out of some fear but mainly anger and panic. And uh, an unjustified fear is never an excuse for taking someone's life. In order to take someone's life based on fear, it has to be honest and reasonable. And someone knocking or pounding on your door at 4.30 in the morning rarely creates an honest and reasonable situation that would justify taking another person's life. So what do we have? One life gone and one life ruined. Uh, I am confident that if you weren't going to prison today, you would never commit another crime for the rest of your life. I'm also certain that you are remorseful and that you regret your actions immeasurably. However, none of that excuses what happened in this case. And I'm certain that you've thought about the family over and over again and how the evidence in this case showed that when Miss McBride was intoxicated, disoriented, injured, and bleeding regardless of whether or not she sought help. She needed help. And when she needed help, she ended up meeting her death. I fully recognize that you did not bring these circumstances to your doorstep. They arrived there. But once they did, you made choices that brought us here today. I would call it the worst mistake of your life, but I don't know that you can ever use the word mistake to describe a murder. And a person was murdered. I, I cannot go below the guidelines. In this case, your attorney wanted four to seven. The prosecutor's office threw People of the state of Michigan through Kim Worthy's office have asked for a guideline sentence and I think that that's reasonable. I do have to assess costs, $68 state cost crime victims assessment in the amount of $130. You're going to be sentenced to two years for the felony firearm conviction, which will be consecutive to the murder in the second degree and the statutory manslaughter convictions, which will run concurrent to one another. For the second degree murder conviction, I'm going to sentence you to 15 to 30 years. For the statutory manslaughter, 7 to 15 years. You will receive credit for 28 days. Mr. Wafer, you have a right to appeal your conviction and sentence with the Court of Appeals. If you can't afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you, and that attorney will be furnished with the necessary record required to handle your appeal. And that request, sir, must be made within 42 days. Your Honor, for the record, Mr. Wafer has filled out the notice of right to timely appeal and request for a court appointed attorney. He does request one, and I have handed it to your clerk so it can be filed. Of course. Thank you very much. That's all. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay.